Uh, welcome, everyone, to Second Tuesdays at PERB. I'm Clary Martin, Executive Director of the Public Employee Relations Board. Uh, today we will be discussing um, unfair labor practices part two, duty of fair representation and duty to bargain. Before we get started, I'd just like to um, let you know that for those of you who are new to the session, we have uh, notebooks over there which have the uh, PERB rules and the statute, in addition to which we have notes from our two previous sessions. And also we have a new schedule, always Tuesdays at PERB, but there may be, there are changes in the uh, topics, slight changes. And Mr. Higgins will talk to you about that when he gets up. And so if there are no questions for me, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Higgins. Mr. Higgins. Oh, this is yours. Oh. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome back. Uh, uh, what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to change the, 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 uh, the agenda for future months just a little bit. Part of it is I'm beginning to realize I'm falling a little bit behind and my hope of, uh, I think, today completing uh, the duty to bargain. I, I, I practiced this presentation and I can't do it in an hour and a half. So I'm going to get the duty to supply information and put that on for the beginning of next month. So that'll be unfair labor practices part three. Uh, my original plan was to do it all today and it isn't going to happen. Um, and uh, secondly, next month, we will begin uh, representation cases, PERB election cases. And, and that will be not only uh, election cases to get, for a union to get certified, election cases for a union to be decertified, uh, unit modification uh, procedures, anything that has to do with the status of the union as the collective bargaining, how, do, how a union gets status and what, can hap what happens to the bargaining unit after that. So that will begin next month. That will be like the second half of the class next month. And again, um, I don't think I'll finish that either because I've got the information and I've got representation cases. So that will be part one. Part two will be in uh, April, uh, representation cases part two. And during that, uh, during that, represent that second session, uh, we're going to show, or I'm going to show you a, a, a 45 minute film. Uh, and it is, uh, it is a mock uh, election conducted by an NLRB regional office. Uh, and I, I, we, we just don't have a film like this for PERB, but PERB does exactly the same thing. The election process is exactly the same. And it's just to give you an idea, for those of you who have never been involved in an election, what's, what, what to expect, what really goes on in those election cases. So it, 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 I think you'll find it quite, quite interesting, quite interesting. So um, any questions about where, we're, where we are, where we're going? And there's a sheet of paper that tells you more about that. Okay. The last preliminary thing I want to mention. <coughs> um, I, at the end of the day, I'd, I'd appreciate if you would, well, everybody would just sit down and make a, make a note about if there's anything that I go over too fast, particularly in this area of duty to bargain. This is an, this, I know this is an important subject for you all. So if, the, if there's something that I, I either go over too fast or I leave out and you'd like to hear more about it, just jot it down. I don't need, I don't need to know who you are. I don't need to know who you are. Just, just say it. You know, talk about this. Again. And I'll put this all together and make that part of my presentation next month, even if it's a little bit out of order. But I promise you, we'll get to some of these concerns you have if I've if I've either ignored them or left them out or, uh, or talked too fast, okay? All right, today we're going to talk about a, uh, an, 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 another aspect of unfair labor practices, but for, for uh, this is one that really only deals with unions, and this is what's called the duty of fair representation. Uh, in, in, in unions, employers do not have a duty of fair representation in the same way. Obviously, they have an ob ob employers have an ob obligation to be fair, and they have an obligation to represent their agency or their clients fairly. 
But the duty of fair representation is something more, much more than that. And the reason it's important, and the reason you should all hear about it is, this is one of probably a, one of the bigger cadre of cases that PERB gets. Uh, and it's the same thing is true at the NLRB. Uh, I, I think if you had to kind of lump uh, the particular alleged violations together into various categories, you would find that uh, complaints, char unfair labor practice charges rather, at the NLRB and complaints at PERB, the, the big bulk of them are duty of fair representation cases. Okay? And these are cases not filed by employers against unions. These are filed by <coughs> employees against their union. Okay? So what is it? What is the duty of fair representation? Well, let's start with a hypothetical. Um, an employee refuses to join a union. He just doesn't want to be part of you all. You know, he just doesn't like unions. Uh, and, uh, and, but, but even though he doesn't like the unions, he's in the unit and he's always grousing about what goes on, what, the, way the, way, the way the union's handling uh, representation. Okay? He is a true thorn in your side. He now comes to, he's now been discharged. Or he's been disciplined. He's been suspended for six weeks or two weeks, okay? And he comes to the union and he says, I'd like to file a grievance. You are, if he, particularly if he was fired, you couldn't be happier to know that he's gone. This thorn in your side has been removed, okay? What can you do about it? What can you do to hurry his departure along? I'm, and I say you, I'm, I'm putting, making sure, as if you are a union. I know some people here are management. But if, what can a union do to hurry his departure along? Uh, it's Mr. By the way, this is Mr. Higgins, too. <laughs> Mr. Higgins. Fail to respond timely, for example. Fail to respond anyway. Okay, fail to respond timely. Anybody else got anything? Well, the answer is nothing. Nothing. There is nothing you can do to hasten his departure. Why? Because you owe that person a duty of fair representation. I don't care what a thorn he's in your side. I don't care whether he doesn't pay dues. I don't care if he's always late in paying his dues. It doesn't make any difference. He, he needs to be treated just the same way you treat your brother-in-law, who you like. Uh, it was in the bargaining unit, okay? Just the way you treat your best friend who's in the bargaining unit. You owe him or her a duty of fair representation. And that's what, that's what PERB says, that's what the NLRB says, and that's what uh, the Supreme Court says. Why is that? Why do unions, wh why do you think, why, do, why does the, the law make it so that you have to treat these thorns in your side well? Anybody have any idea? Yes, sir. Yeah, because you're the exclusive representative. That's exactly right. You've got, the, the government has given you as a union a license. It's a very important license. It's a license to speak about for everyone. Okay? And that, right, that license to speak, that right to speak, um, um, comes with responsibilities. And one is to treat everybody equally. So you say, well, I've got a copy of CMPA. Uh, in fact, uh, it's right over there in that yellow, blue pad. I, I look in it, and, and there's nothing in there about it. But I will tell you, by the way, it's a, it's a, it's a violation of Section 8B of the Unfair Labor Practice Code, 8B1. But it's, it's a violation of, uh, I'll tell you which, which, where it is. It's, uh, ooh. I should have this in the finger. What section? What, 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 what chapter is it? 617.08B? I think it's B. It's the unfair labor practice provisions of, of PERB, okay? It's where the, it's, it's the provision of the statute that says the union uh, shall not interfere, restrain, or coerce employees in the exercise of their rights to uh, under, under, under the CMPA, okay? It's that provision, okay? But it doesn't say a word about the duty of fair representation. And you search long and hard in CMPA to find any reference to a duty of fair representation. 
There is a place in the standards of conduct, but I'm not sure that really is a DFR thing. So where does it come from? It comes from the Supreme Court. It comes from a Supreme Court case in 1944 uh, called Steele versus Louisville and Nashville Railroad. And the, the Steele versus, Mr. Steele was a black employee who belonged to a, a union that had a discriminatory seniority system. And so he sued the union and he sued the railroad because the railroad was administering it. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court and he won. But in the course of, of winning it, the Supreme Court laid down this concept of the duty of fair representation. Uh, uh, the Supreme Court held that um, the, the statute gives the unions the, the, the right to exclusively represent employees, and with that right comes responsibilities. Now, it's the same rule under the NLRA. By the, by the way, excuse me, Steele was suing under the Railway Labor Act, not under the National Labor Relations Act, and not under CMPA. Okay, so it's the Railway, Railway Labor Act there. Later, the NLRB said, this applies to our cases, too, and PERB has said the same thing. Um, as I say, the standards of conduct provisions of CMPA do make a sort of a, a, a ref, kind of a reference to it, but I don't think it's exactly uh, the, 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 uh, the, du the, the duty of fair representation. It, CMPA uh, uh, section 617.03A1, the standards of conduct. These are the standards of conduct for unions, okay? It says uh, employees must be given fair and equal treatment under the governing rules of the organization. That's really not the duty of fair representation, but it does treat, you have to treat them fairly under, their, under your bylaws. All right, so how has it been defined? How has it been defined? Well, if you bear with me, I'm going to read a couple of quotes from the Supreme Court. They're not very long, but I think it, 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 the Supreme Court says it a lot better than I can. Okay? In a case called Ford Motor versus Huffman in 1953, the Supreme Court said, a union's statutory obligation to represent all members of an appropriate unit requires them to make an honest effort to serve the interests of all of those members Without any host without hostility to any, and 14 years later, in a case called Vaca versus Sipes, the Supreme Court again said, "This is not a uh, this is another another case uh, on duty of fair representation." Quote: The exclusive agent's statutory authority to represent all members of a designated unit includes a statutory obligation to serve the interests of all members without hostility or discrimination toward any, to exercise its discretion with complete good faith and honesty, and to avoid arbitrary conduct. The duty of fair representation applies to virtually all of the dealings uh, of a union with, uh, with, its, with its, not just its members, with the people it represents, because the duty applies to non-members too. The two major areas it comes up in are, of course, grievance handling and collective bargaining, because the duty applies when you are sitting there handling, when you, the union, are handling a grievance. It also hand, when you are sitting there at the table bargaining the new contract. Let's take grievance handling first. So what is the union's obligation when the employee comes in and asks them to process the grievance? And it's very simple. It's what the Supreme Court just says. Don't deal with that grievance in a discriminatory, an arbitrary, or a bad faith way. So my cousin, Mr. Higgins, was wrong when he says, put it aside and forget about it. You can't do that. That would be clearly a breach of the duty of fair representation. Okay. Can the union say no? Employee one comes up to you and he you don't like him. You really don't like this guy. And he wants you to process a grievance. Can you say no? Yes. Yes. Who said that? Okay. When can you say no? When you're investigating this That's right. Exactly the right answer. Would they 
Okay. Well, oh, so I'm sorry. The question, the, my question was, when can you say no? And his answer was, you can say no when you've investigated and you're satisfied it's not a good grievance. Okay. Did I quote you correctly? Okay. Okay. Um, when you, when you, in good faith, have looked into it, and you're satisfied, you're satisfied that this grievance um, um, is it does lacks merit, or is of such questionable merit, you're not willing to take the union's funds and expend them on this grievance. Okay. But that decision has to be made. That decision has to be made in good faith too. Um, let me do, again. Let me let me quote from from the Supreme Court uh, on this particular point. And this is on the question of can an employee compel the union to take a grievance to arbitration? Can the union can can, can the union be forced to go to arbitration? The Supreme Court said in Baca, uh, if an if an individual employee could compel arbitration of his grievance regardless of its merit the settlement machinery provided by the contract would be substantially undermined. And a significantly greater number of grievances would pr proceed to arbitration. This, the Supreme Court said, would greatly increase the cost of our grievance machinery and would so overburden the pro arbitration process as to prevent it from functioning successfully. And then they went on, however, to say, but even, uh, the union, even with good grievances, it may not arbitrarily ignore a meritorious grievance or process it, and here's the important word, in a perfunctory fashion. Give it the back of your hand. That, if it's a meritorious grievance, your obligation is to push that grievance hard, or as you say in the Mid-Atlantic, hard. I, my, my Boston accent comes out, comes out every now and then. All right. Yes, sir. How extensively does the union have to document its investigation and its subjective decision to say, no, we're not taking this case to arbitration? Okay. The, the, uh, the, the man who's taking the films has asked me to repeat questions, so I'm going to repeat it. So just make sure it gets, it's on the, on the tape here. He wants to know how, the question is, how much does a, the union have to document its efforts to investigate? Well, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, don't know, I don't really know how to answer that. Um, um, it must, must make a good faith effort. Does it have to uh, have affidavits? Does it have to have um, um, uh, sworn testimony on things? Not necessarily. It, you need to put together enough of a case to satisfy yourself and to maybe satisfy Clarine Martin and her staff that uh, what you ought to satisfy the NLRB, to satisfy them that you're in good faith, okay? And um, you, you, you've got to remember that the people at PERB, just like the people at the NLRB, weren't born yesterday. These are people who spend their professional careers ferreting out bad faith motives. That's their job, to figure out what's going on inside people's head. And if it's bad, prosecute them for it. So they know how to, they, they know how to determine that. But I'm going to go in, when, when I talk a little bit about um, the duty to bargain, uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the PERB and the NLRB investigate bad faith bargaining. The, the same kind of points that I'm going to be making then would apply here. But I think the, the, fact, the fact is if you can show that you uh, interviewed the employee, the member or a non-member, you went to a, uh, 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 maybe contacted your lawyer if you had a question, you contacted the employer to ask him or her a little bit about what, what, what went on, you did a little bit of research into the history of what the union has done with similar grievances in the past. Put all that together, and that obviously, I think that begins to show that you are making a good, good faith effort. You're not dealing with this request in a perfunctory fashion, as the Supreme Court would say. Okay. Um, what if, 
I, I'm, what, what if you just um, uh, decide you're halfway through the grievance? You've taken it. You're halfway through the grievance. And whether it's a person you like or you don't like, okay, you're halfway through and all of a sudden you realize this is not a good grievance. And I process thing up through, I processed this case up through step three, and now my question is, am I going to take this to arbitration? And I now realize in listening to the employer's step three response, I haven't got a case. Do you have to go to arbitration? No. Does the mere fact that you took it to arbit took it took the grievance mean you have to go to arbitration? And the answer is, no. this gentleman is always seems to always he always has the right answer. And the answer the answer is no. And then that is correct. If your decision is made, made in good faith. Um, as in, in a matter of fact, that quote from the Supreme Court seems almost to suggest you may have an obligation not to take it. The obligation is to the members who are paying dues and whose money you're going to expend. And it's also maybe to, to the employer, to the, to, to the agency, to the collective bargaining process, not to clog up the collective bargaining channel with a lot of junky grievances that have no merit at all so that when the good ones come along, it's going to take them a long time. The, the, the man or the woman who lost his job and who deserves to get his job back has to wait a few, a three, a four extra months or years because you've loaded the grievance machinery up with bad grievances. So the, the Supreme Court seems to suggest you have that obligation too. Um, let me give you a, uh, I was going to say it's a hypothetical, but it's not a hypothetical. This is an actual case. Union has a resource problem. It's a resource problem. A little short of money, okay? And they decide that there's, they're not going to take any more warning letters to arbitration. Why? There this, this this seems, seems to be too many of them. So and they don't have the funds to do it. So they decide that we'll take the grievance, we'll file it, uh, but we're going to sit on it, and we won't act on it until the employer, until an employee is discharged. And then if this discharge and the employer is relying on the warning letter, we'll take the, the warning letter and the discharge to arbitration. So a guy gets a discharge, and he says, um, um, uh, uh, I'd like you to take my grievance, take this to arbitration. The union says, no, we're not going to do that. We've decided this is our policy. We're going to sit on these warning letter cases. Um, he says, you can't do that to me. He says, I've been paying my dues. This warning letter is like a, 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 an ax hanging over my head. And it's destroyed my reputation in the, in the, in the shop. And I want, it, I want my name cleared. And I've got, I'm entitled to it. The union says, we're not going to do it. Permissible? Can the union say? The union says, yeah, we agree with you, by the way, mister. That warning letter is probably um, a, a, a grievable matter, and if we take it, if we took it up, we'd probably win it. We agree with you, but we're not going to take it. Is, that, is the warning letter linked to discharge or not? Just could be, because it could be the warning that, the point that triggers the discharge two months or three months okay, hence. That's just a possibility, though. And those are the cases they're taking. They'll take those cases up. They'll, I mean, when I say up, they'll take those cases to arbitration. Well, by then, the, your, your opportunity to grieve the warning letter is probably lapsed by then. No, I said they, they'll take the grievance and they'll file it with the employer oh, so, that, so, that, so, that, so that the meter is no longer running, but they, they file agreements with the employer and then they just sit on it. So they, 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 have, they haven't lost. The, the, the time for the grievance. So put that, put that issue aside. If, 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 if the time was lost, you, 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 it would be a problem, yes. Well, the, the Eighth Circuit said that was a perfectly permissible thing for a union to do. The union, the, the union had a, it was, the union's motivations were not malevolent, they're not bad motives. They were, uh, they were because of resource problems. Not every, the union didn't have an inexhaustible source of funds, and uh, and the decision was made in good faith, and they chose a, a, a means, a, a way of a way of handling it so that the worst cases got resolved. Okay, 
And, and that brings me to the phrase the Supreme Court uses, and I will use it three or four more times today. A union, in making decisions with respect to um, uh, grievance handling and arbitration, has what the Supreme Court calls a wide range of reasonableness. The Supreme Court has said there is, in most of these cases, no perfect answer. Okay? There's no perfect answer. There's a, there's a wide range in which a union can operate, and if it stays within that range, that range of reasonableness, and is in good faith, it will, uh, it will um, um, uh, win. Okay? So that phrase, wide range of reasonableness, is a very important phrase. How about the arbitration hearing itself? Um, you get to the arbitration, and the employee says, uh, I want to testify. Uh, this, this, this case, I, this is my chance to clear my name. I want to get on that stand and make sure everybody understands how strongly I feel about this. And the union says, uh, we're not going to put you on the stand. And the reason we're not going to put you on the stand is you are a loose cannon. Okay. First of all, um, I'm not sure you, I'm not sure, Mr. Employee, that, that you've told us the truth on everything. Uh, be that as it may, whether you told us the truth on everything or not, we think your grievance has merit and we're processing it. But if you get on the stand, your credibility might be impugned and that might hurt the whole grievance. And you've got a short fuse, and short fuse people are not the kind of people who make the best, best, best advocates for their own case. So our judgment is you're not going to take the witness stand. He says, you can't do that to me. This is you. I, the, the, he gets all upset. Do you have to put him on the stand? It's his grievance, isn't it? Isn't it his grievance? Why shouldn't he be able to say that, what, what he wants? Well, the, the, the answer, yes, yes, those are the reasons. The answer is, it isn't his grievance. Okay, remember that. It's your, well, if you're the union. It's the union, it's the union's grievance. The union makes these kinds of decisions, and they, but they have to be made in good faith, and he doesn't judge it. So just as, for example, he says, aren't you going to have a lawyer for my grievance? You mean to say the, the, uh, the, the, the business agent is going to be processing this, grie this grievance and Take, arguing that case in arbitration, he didn't go to law school. This is terrible. You're treating me badly. Do you have to have a lawyer take cases to arbitration? And the answer, no. Provided you don't, that's your general policy, and you decide you, 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 you have non-lawyers handle the arbitration for people who you don't like. And lawyers handle them for people you don't like. That's a different problem. I think we all can re we all can see what that problem is. Okay, but again, it's the union's decision to decide. It's the union's decision as to how it's going to process the grievance because it is the union's grievance. As long as the union's in good faith, and as long as the union is not acting in a, as the Supreme Court say said, in a perfunctory fashion, not giving the case the back of its hand. What if they're having a meeting? Uh, the union's having a meeting, a, a union meeting, a union meeting. All the members are there, the non-members aren't there, of course, and this grievant non-member wants to come. And he knows that that's what you're going to be talking about at the meeting. He knows you're going to be talking about his grievance and you're going to be making a decision about what to do with his grievance at the meeting. And he says, I'd like to come. And you've never, ever allowed a non-union member to step across that threshold. We, you don't let non-members in. Do you have to let him in? No. No. You said no. Any, anybody else? That doesn't mean the answer is yes. <laughs> what it means is, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. If I was, if you came to me and I was your lawyer and you said, should we let him in? I'd say, yeah. Yeah, let him in. 
It's, well, I, I actually, I might I'd say, don't let them in, and then I'll get a case out of this thing. Uh, but, but no, no, I, I might say, I, yeah, yeah, let him in. He can't vote, he can't talk, because he, he's not a member. But at least you're showing him good faith as to how you're treating his grievance, and maybe that will. <laughs> he, he is, after all, one of your customers. He is a person you represent. And just showing him, or showing her, that you're, you, 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 you care, might go a long way toward uh, solving a problem later on in terms of whether there's going to be a, a, a charge at PERB or a charge uh, or a, law, or a lawsuit someplace. Um, what if the union decides? investigates the case, decides in very good conscience, that very good faith, that the um, grievance has no merit. And the grievant, in the meantime, however, has taken this case to an unemployment compensation claim hearing and has won. And in the course of winning, there are certain things the unemployment compensation hearing officer says that now calls into question whether the union was right about this grievance having no merit. What do you do then if you're the union? You know, the you, is there still time to request arbitration? Let's assume that. If you're the union or you're the, the person about the, the decision? You're the union. Uh, all of my questions are, are hypotheticals as to you, the union, okay? What do you think? What would you do? What would you do? I mean, you in good faith said no. This guy's now come to you with this unemployment hearing. Uh, it, it doesn't. It doesn't dispose of the case uh, by any means. But there's some language in there that it's, it, it, it's just a little bit troublesome. But I think the answer is you can still say no. As long as you're satisfied. As long as you seriously look at it take a careful look at what that unemployment compensation hearing officer did, and you say to yourself, you know, I don't, even, I don't care what he said. I know that, I know the language is, is, makes, it, makes, it, makes my decision look questionable, but on balance, I still think this is a bad grievance. If that's the way you think, deny the grievance, okay? You don't, unemployment compensation hearing officers are not union representatives. They're not lawyers, necessarily. And it's your, it's your job to make the, make the judgment call. That's what they're paying you for. That's what they're paying you for. Okay. Um, you know, let's, let, let's take a, um, other situations where, um, excuse me, hold on for a second. I just lost my place. Oh, yeah, I'm, oh, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Does anybody here uh, involved in any way with a hiring hall? Are there any people from unions that run hiring halls? Are there any people who have been involved with hiring halls? Everybody know what I mean by hiring hall? Oh, some people are saying no. A hiring hall is a relationship between an employer and a union in which the employer agrees, usually exclusively agrees, that he, the employer will get all his work or all his help from the union through the hiring hall. So people go to the union and they register to go to work. They register to go to work and then the employer, when he needs somebody, calls up and says, can you send somebody over? Okay, yes. Do you have that? Yes, sir. Okay, so that in, 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 in DC government? Uh, no, it's not DC government. Okay, okay. Well, in any event, anyway, I, I, I'm using this just to give you to give a, a, another example of the duty of fair representation. Outside the grievance machinery, okay. Mo by the way, most hiring halls are in the construction industry or in the uh, entertainment industry, uh, um, but uh, and most of them have, are, are exclusive, so that the employer and the union agree that the employer will go only go to the carpenters when he wants carpenters, only go to the plumbers when he wants a plumber. Okay?
Does the union's duty of fair representation extend to that kind of situation? What do you think? Should the, does the union have to treat everybody who comes into the hiring hall fairly? By the way, you don't have to be a union member in order to use the hiring hall. You don't have to be a union member in order to use the hiring hall. So does, but does the union have to treat non-members who the, people, they don't even know, walk in and say, I'm a plumber, and they get a plumber's license. But they never saw the guy before. Do they have to treat him the same way they treat people who have been using the hiring hall for years? Yes. And the answer is yes. Okay. And the, what the NLRB has said, and, uh, and what, uh, what PERB would say if they had a hiring hall case, is that a hiring hall has to have objective standards. You have, to, you have to have objective standards, not subjective standards, in deciding whether to send people out, out, out from the hall. Um, what about this? The union says, look, you know, if you've got, if you've got a beef with us, if you've got a beef with us, um, we'd like you to um, uh, come to us first. Don't go running down to PERB and whining to PERB, you know? Don't go running down and whining to the NLRB. Come to us first. As a matter of fact, that's our rule. We're not objecting to you going to PERB. We're not objecting, but give us a chance to straighten out our own house before you start smearing us all over the, uh, all over the District of Columbia. So we have, we, have, we have a rule like that. Can they have such a rule? It's a, it's, it, it, it's not only is it a pub, that's a public policy question, by the way, it's also a duty of fair representation question. What do you think? Should you have a right, should a union have a right to clean its own house first? Ah, uh, there's a man back there that shook his head no, and he's right, you're wrong this time. Yeah, the, the answer is no, okay? What that rule is telling people is, the, the union can, can encourage people to come to us first, I mean, you know, they, they can do that. They can have a system uh, where they really advertise their internal uh, union cr uh, system, okay? But to have a rule in which they are telling people it is a violation of our, of our bylaws for you to go to the government before you come to us, that is a breach of the duty of fair representation. You know, yes, you're trying, yes, your motives are good, but your goal here is bad. You've deprived people of the right to go to the NLRB, to go to PERB, okay? Um, what about this? You're uh, in negotiations and um, uh, you're negotiating some sort of a system for um, vacations. Who gets first choice on, a va on vacations? And... Um, um, the, uh, the employer says, well, look, I, you know, I don't, I don't really care how we do it. You guys set it up. Tell us, what you, tell us what you want in the contract. And the union says, well, you know, I'd like to take care of my brothers first, okay? My brothers and my sisters within the union, okay? So I would like seniority to depend on how long you've been a union member. And, uh, and, and, and so union members who are old timers get first crack. They're old timers within the union. Okay? That was a question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Thumbs down in the back. One, I got I, I, one thumbs down. Any other thumbs down? Any thumbs up? Can you have anything? Well, how do, well, how do you figure seniority if you can't do that? Years of employment. Yeah, years of employment. That is correct. That's job related. Union membership is not job related. And that would be a breach of the duty of fair representation. You're not fairly re representing the non-members, the, 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 the people who just joined the union, or the people who never joined the union. Okay? It's a, that would be a breach of the duty of fair representation. Okay. Those hypotheticals that I just gave don't necessarily involve grievance handling. Uh, they involve how the union treats people. Um, and, and just very simply, it's the breach of the duty of fair representation is violated here because it isn't fair to have a rule that prohibits people from going to PERB. And it's not fair to have a seniority system 
that's based on union membership. Uh, and it's not fair to refuse a, 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 a person any rights simply because he or she is not a good union member. So all of that is to, is, um, um, sum, is, is to summarize, if you will, the, um, the duty of fair representation as to grievance handling. Again, and I'm summarizing, unions have been giving, gi given great power and how, and, uh, and they need to use it wisely and in good faith. Um, I think the best way to do it is think of them as customers. Keep them as, keep them as, think of them as customers. The customer is always right. Well, not necessarily, but, but at least you've got to presume, presume that they're right be, at the, as you begin your investigation, okay? All right, that's grievance handling. What about collective bargaining? The duty, as I say, the duty of fair representation applies at the bargaining table, too. Um, um, that, that hypothetical that I gave you about Agree, the union agreeing to a union membership rather than a unit membership for seniority is an example. What about this one? The union agrees in the bargaining to give seniority credit to veterans. And by the way, seniority credit, whether the veterans ever work for the employer or not, seniority credit, in other words, someone comes to work for <laughs> D.C. Police Department, or I, 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 I don't know what the, what the seniority system is there, but they've never they've never been a, never worked for the D.C. government before, but they served four years in the army, so they immediately get four years of seniority. Is that okay? Are we talking about only government employees? Well, well let, let, this, let, let's, let's take it out of the government. Any, the, this, the, the principle applies whether it's a government job or, 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 so it, or, or, or a private sector job. So the, the, the rule would be the same. I'm not telling you what the rule is. You tell me. What do you think? No. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll tell you something. It, it's, it's permissible. And why is it permissible? Because the Supreme Court said it was. Remember that case I read way back earlier? I said Ford, Ford v. Huffman about uh, um, uh, duty of fair representation. Well, the, the lawsuit there was Mr. Huffman sued Ford Motor because Ford and UAW had a collective bargaining contract that gave veterans coming back from the Second World War uh, seniority regardless of whether they ever worked for whether they worked for Ford before they went before the war, so they they never worked for Ford before they come back from the war. They get a job on the assembly line. All of a sudden, they get five years seniority. The guy who didn't go to war, didn't serve. Maybe he was too young. Okay, maybe he's too young. Um, he starts the same day. He's got zero seniority. Supreme Court said that's okay. That's okay. The union wants to acknowledge people who serve their country. That's what, that's, that, that fits within the wide range of reasonableness that we've been talking about, the Supreme Court said. And, that's, and that particular clause is okay. All right, they're at the bargaining table and the union says, or the union, the union president says, I'd like to have a system for super seniority for union officers. The employer says, what do you mean by that? He says, well, I just like to, any time, anywhere and any time in the, in the collective bargaining contract where seniority is a factor, I want you to give the union leadership, the union officers, seniority. So they, they, they always, super seniority, regardless of how much time they have with the, the agency, regardless of how much time we have with the company, I don't care. They always go to the top of the pile for promotions, 
for transfers, for bumping, whatever it is, they go to the top of the pile. Okay? What, can anybody think of a reason why you'd want any kind of super seniority for union officials? Yes, sir. Doing uh, reorganization or risk on management to keep the uh, leadership uh, intact so that you would be able to handle fair representation. You read my notes? <laughs> Did you hear his answer? Yeah, he said that, the, that management and the union want to keep the union intact, or the, member, the, the union leadership intact, so that there's somebody there during a riff who can handle problems that come up with a riff, or with a, with a layoff, or, or anything else uh, that goes on the plan. That's exactly right. And that's why the hypothetical that I just gave would be, it would be unlawful. Because their super seniority was not limited to individuals who are representing employees. I, I set it up so that it, even the, the sergeant at arms of the union well, the recording secretary gets super seniority. Unlikely that they're involved in worrying about who goes, who goes out and who goes, doesn't go out and run riffs. And by the way, it has to also be limited to layoff and recall. To just to give, to, to give those, just because you're going to give them uh, super seniority doesn't, to, to protect them, them during riffs, that doesn't, that's no reason why they should get preferential vacations. That's no reason why they should get preferential uh, uh, transfer rights. Okay. So there is a, a body of law that says it's not a breach of the union's duty of fair representation. Indeed, that's exactly what they're doing. They're trying to represent the employees, so they want to make sure that in the event that there's a, there's, a lip, or there's a riff, that the last person out the door is going to be the union guy, okay, or the union woman, who's going to be handling the, um, um, the, the negotiations for the RIF and the administration of the RIF. Okay. Yes, sir. Can you give an example of a, of a case where the wide range of reasonableness straddles the line between the duty of fair representation? Well, I, actually, the, I, I think the, uh, that, that veterans case, I think that Ford v. Huffman probably is it may, it, may, it may have been in the outer, outer, outer limits of reasonableness. You know, it, the Supreme Court says it says it was reasonable to give preference to veterans, okay, because they served their country. But yeah, you could they couldn't they have just as easily come down the other way and said this doesn't have anything to do with the job and there's no reason to give them that. It's laudable that the union wants to do it. It's laudable that the company wants to do it, but they can't deprive other employees of their rights. They they, they could have come out the other way. They didn't. So when you say, the, the question was, can you give an example where it's straddling or it's kind of could go either way? I would say that case could have gone either way. Now, would it, by the way, would it have happened, would, would that same decision come out today? That case was decided by the Supreme Court in 1953 and it involved negotiations UAW negotiations in the late 40s. By the time the case got to the Supreme Court, it was the early 50s. So we were, we were finishing the Second World War, a great surge of patriotism, a great respect for veterans, returning veterans. There was all sorts of feelings about that. Would it have, would, would it have happened, for example, would the Supreme Court have said the same thing after Vietnam? I think they should have, but would they? Eh, it's hard to tell. I mean, a lot depends on how you, just how you look at it and where you are in, in, in history, okay? But I think there's one that's, that does straddle, straddle the... Uh, uh, Are there more recent examples to kind of try and get a feel for what approaches that line? Well, um, the, 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 the hypothetical that we just, we just dealt with, there's, the, that, the, the, there's an example where if, the, if you go over the line and give benefits to people that, to union officials, that aren't really processing grievances, that's unreasonable. If you give benefits to, uh, seniority benefits to union officials that are processing grievances, that's reasonable. If you give them seniority as to vacation, that doesn't really have anything to do with RIFs or protecting employees during RIFs. So that's unreasonable. But if you limit that seniority to layoff and recall, that's reasonable. So that, that, I, think, I think there's a good example of a situation where 
depending on how far the union goes, would might cast it one way or cast it the other. Okay. okay um, well, are there any questions? I'm going to close this off now. Any questions about the duty of fair representation? You know, by the way, there's, there's an easy answer to this for, for union officials who say, oh my God, how, what do I do? And the, and the answer is, just be a nice guy. You know, that's just be a nice guy. Don't be one of those arrogant jerks who thinks just because I'm president of the local, I got a right to say no and I don't have to explain myself. Hell, I got elected, okay? Well, that's how you get unelected, by the way. But, but, but that's how you get yourself on the short end of a lawsuit for duty of fair representation. Now, it's not, it's not a breach of the duty of fair representation to be arrogant and to be a jerk. It's not, it's not a breach of the duty of fair representation, but it's what brings about lawsuits. That's what, that's what you, that's what you as, a, as, as a union leader should be trying to avoid. You know? I mean, you, put your ego aside. Put your pride aside. You know, the guy, the guy wants to vent in front of you. There's no reason why you have to scream back at him. You know, he just lost his job, and you're, t you're telling him you're not going to do anything for him. You're in good faith. Take it like a man. Take it like a woman. It's going to be better for the union. And it's certainly going to be better for uh, the, the, uh, your, your legal, your legal, your attorney, your attorney's fees budget uh, when you no longer, uh, uh, when, when this guy says, you know, they, okay, they treated me fairly, I'm not going to sue. So, the duty of fair representation is a legal rule, okay? Mm -hmm. But so much of this this particular area comes down to just plain good labor, good human relations, not labor relations, good human relations, okay? All right, any, we're going to move right now. Um, oh, 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 well, no, there is one more thing I want to talk about. Strikes. I want to talk about strikes. Um, just very briefly, and it, let me say, how do strikes have anything to do with the duty of fair representation? Well, CMPA makes strikes illegal. Okay? Everybody knows that it's an unfair labor practice. If a union calls a strike, it commits an unfair labor practice. If it calls a uh, a, uh, a sick out, yeah, it's a strike. It's a strike. So it's a voluntary withholding of labor. Uh, it's in a concerted way. That's that's what we call a strike. You can call it whatever you want, but it's a strike. Okay. And, and Purple call it a strike too. I'll tell you right now. All right. So the union says to the membership, look, we're not getting a fair shake at the table. We need to wake up this agency. So. We'd like to have everybody take, take a sick day tomorrow, okay? Breach of the duty of fair representation? And if it is, why do you, how, how, how could it be? Under what circumstances? And what difference does it make? Because it's already an unfair labor practice. They're going to get you for an unfair labor practice. So what difference does it make if it's a duty of, breach of the duty of fair representation? Well, you know what it is? It, it could be an additional remedy for what you did. That is, a breach of the duty of fair representation. If those people who take the day off get, it, get disciplined, lose a day's pay, lose two days pay, lose their jobs, if they lose their jobs or lose, the, lose that day's pay because the, the union's telling them to do it, their collective bargaining unit or, or their collective bargaining representative, the person who owes them the duty of fair representation told them to do it, the union not only has committed an unfair labor practice, it probably has breached the duty of fair representation, and it's going to be, the union's going to have to pay the back pay for that. The union's going to have, probably have to pay. I don't think there's a, by, by the way, I, I shouldn't say, I'm saying probably because I don't think there's a PERB case on this point, okay? But I would be shocked if PERB came out any other way, uh, if, if that happened and didn't order back pay for the people who lost their jobs because they were following the, the edicts or the mandate of their collective bargaining representative. Okay. All right. Me, yes, sir. Back pay against the union? Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. We're going to go now from another to another duty. This is called the duty to bargain. 
everybody has this duty. The duty of fair representation, of course, is only for unions. The duty to bargain applies just as much to unions as to employers. Uh, this is this is an. Uh, by the way, can somebody tell me what time it is? How am I doing? Eleven. Ooh, ooh! I gotta really talk fast. All right. Um, uh, the 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 duty to, the duty to bargain um, is a is a huge topic, and I, I, my, my Clarine wanted me to try to cover as much of it today as I possibly can. And we, 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 I was actually hoping to get the whole thing done today. I am just not going to do it as I, as, I, as I told you. But it, it, it falls, I've divided the subject of duty to bargain into four areas, and then I'm going to take them one at a time. The, the first area is the area of exclusivity. Okay? The union is the exclusive bargaining representative. And what does that mean vis-a-vis -vis the, the bargaining at the table? Uh, the, the union sitting and the employer sitting down. What, what, what effect does that exclusivity have at the table? The second thing we're going to talk about is the standards of bargaining. You know? um, um, just what does it mean? What does per, what does CMPA mean when it says the employer and the union have a duty to bargain in good faith? What does that, what does that mean? Third, what do you have to bargain about? What are the subjects about which a union and an employer must bargain, okay? Must bargain. And then fourth, what other duties come? Well, in, in particular, what duties does an employer have to the union, and vice versa, does the union have to the employer with respect to requests made of them for necessary and relevant information what for, that, the, that the party needs either to decide whether a grievance, or to, uh, um, uh, or, or to, or to, to, to make a decision as to whether to give, a, what, to, what to do at the bargaining table. Okay, the duty to supply information. Okay, and by the way, I, 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 a couple of people heads jerked up when I said it, but the union has just as much of a duty to supply necessary and relevant information as does the employer. We'll talk about that when we get to it. Okay, so no, no surprises here on that. On the, I don't want to surprise you with this. All right. All right. Um, now you have a a binder, your blue your blue binder. Uh, um, uh, and in your blue binder, if you turned, you don't have to. I'm going to tell you what it says. But if you if you did turn to section one six zero seven one six one seven zero four a five and b three, you would see that it in both cases a union and an employer have a duty to bargain collectively in good faith. Both the union and the employer have that duty, all right? So what does it mean? What does good faith mean? Uh, uh, CMPA doesn't tell you. And even if you go over to the NLRA, the, the, sort of the granddaddy of uh, labor relations statutes, okay, that doesn't tell you what good faith means. Uh, uh, so you have to go to the, de de the decisions of those agencies. And you really got to go to the NLRB, the NLRA. Why? Because PERB has virtually, a, with some exceptions, but PERB has virtually adopted the NLRB's rules with respect to what is and what is not good faith bargaining. So, NLRB decisions, and we're, I'm going to talk a, little bit, a lot more about them today than I have in the past, because PERB, PERB talks about them all the time, too. Um, uh, just for, exa for example, back in 1991, PERB had a, a, a case uh, where an agency said that it, it didn't have to produce information for bargaining because CMPA didn't say anything about it information for bargaining. The word information was not in CMPA, so why would they have to produce it? And Perb says, well, I will tell you why you have to produce it. You have to produce it because the, that's the law under the NLRA, uh, and we follow the NLRA, and they then quoted the Supreme Court's decision in NLRB versus ACME, which is the, the, the core case of the NLRB about the duty to supply information. So PERB has been very clear about that. So I thought just very quickly, let me, let me tell you what 
the NLRA says the duty to bargain is. And by the way, the NLRA doesn't use the word good faith. Uh, it doesn't define, doesn't define good faith. Section 8D of the National Labor Relations Act says, for purposes of this section, to bargain collectively is the performance of the mutual obligation of the employer and the representative of the employees to meet at reasonable times and to confer in good faith with respect to wages, hours, and other, ter other terms and conditions of employment or the negotiation of a, an agreement. Uh, I just lost my place. Uh, or any questions arising thereunder, and the execution of a written contract incorporating any agreement reached, if requested by the other party, uh, provided um, that there sh that the, the the that provided that this obligation does not compel either party uh, to uh, to uh, make a concession. So that's what the NLRA says uh, uh, bargaining in good faith means. Um, one of the problems with, with these cases, uh, these, are, these are very highly emotional cases, and, 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 and they are very, very, very fact-bound. You know, I, I can get up here and, and, and give you some black letter principles of law that if I wrote them up here on the board that would be absolutely legally right. But whether they would apply in your bargaining situation is clearly, clearly going to depend on the depend on the facts, and so I don't. I, I, I caution you against um, taking anything I said as I say as legal advice with respect to bargaining. Okay, I'm not your lawyer, uh, and, and and that's not my job. And these issues, you know, go go to the very sometimes can go to the very core of your relationship with the union or your very core of your relationship with the agency. And, you know, if you have a question like these, this is for you to sit down with your lawyer, certainly not with me. All right. The first thing I said was exclusivity. That's the first of the four things we're going to talk about. Um, um, and that goes, that is, that really deals with the specific, specifically with the legal status of the union. And I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times already, but I'm going to say it again. The union is the exclusive representative of unit employees on matters of wages, hours, and other terms and conditions of employment. And the employer who seeks to undermine that relationship, okay, commits an unfair labor practice, commits an unfair labor practice under 61704A5, okay, because that is a breach of his obligation to bargain in good faith. Well. How, do you, how, does it, how would an employer do it? Well, the, the, the most likely candidate for the, uh, an, an, an A5 violation with respect to exclusivity goes to the question is direct dealing, okay? Where the employer, employer's representatives, supervisors start to deal directly with rank and file employees instead of dealing with the union, okay? Um, now, I use the word dire direct uh, dealing with it very advisedly because it's not wrong. It's, it is certainly permissible for an employer to talk to employees about wages, hours, and working conditions. Okay? Perfectly all right. You just can't deal with them. What does that mean? Dealing with is almost a synonym for bargaining. It's trying, it's tr trying to get them to change their position uh, uh, d d d that in, a, in a way that, that may maybe undermines the union at the bargaining table. That may be your motive. But even if it's not your motive, even if it's you're trying to strike a deal and, you know, it's just going to be bet just between you and me. If, if you do this little bit of extra work, I'll give you a little bit of extra money, or I'll give you a little bit of extra overtime, or whatever it happens to be. And that, and that helps me when I get my job done. I don't have to deal with that damn union and all those crazy rules and so forth. You're dealing with that employee. You're, you're negotiating with them. Like it or not, that's what you're doing. And that's a violation of the duty to bargain because you're not dealing with the exclusive representative. Um, um, A 
I want to just tell you two cases. They're old. These are really old cases. In fact, they both go back to 1944. That's, I, I, was, I was alive then, though, too. But, um, the first is a case called J.I. Case. Okay? It was a, a Supreme Court case. And it, it, it's, it's, it's a, it, but it, it exemplifies, I think, well, this whole business about direct dealing. It probably is unlikely that on the facts I'm going to tell you about that, that these facts could get repeated today, but it does tell you a little bit about what the Supreme Court thinks direct dealing is. The employees here all had an individual collective bargaining agreement. Excuse me. They all had individual employment contracts with the employer. And in other words, each employer, is, each employee that came to work signed an employment contract with the employer for a year or two years or whatever it was. Um, the union came in. The union won the election and became the certified bargaining representative. And the employer said to the union, uh, yeah, I'll sit down and bargain you, bargain you a, a, a contract when these individual contracts expire, expire, but I've got an obligation to honor these individual contracts with my employees. They filed an unfair labor practice charge with the board. Case it ended up in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, that's a breach of the duty to bargain. Those employees have now chosen the union. They had an election. They decided that the union is their exclusive bargaining representative, and you have an obligation to deal with them. Forget those individual contracts. They don't exist, pal. You deal with the union now on this issue. That's J.I. Case. The same year, in a case called Mito Photo, okay, um, the, employees, uh, em the employees, there was a union already in there, and some employees approached the employer and said, they said, hey, boss, you know, if you could give us a raise, that's, all, that's really all we really want. And if you give us a raise, We'll, we'll, we'll get rid of this union. We'll, 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 we'll withdraw from the union. We'll tell the union to get that, get lost. None of us will join. It, 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 it will go away. Just give us the raise. The boy said, if that's what the employees want, you are my, they're my employees. I need to treat them fairly. And so he struck that deal. And that deal was held to be a bad faith bargain. Okay? It was a violation of exclusivity. It was a violation of the concept of exclusivity exclusivity. All right. I said a moment ago, then you, you say, well, hey, let's give, us, give me an example of when, uh, when it's okay for me to talk to my employees about wages and hours. And you said it's okay. Should, tell me when, when talking to them is not direct dealing. Well, it happens as a PERB case. Um, it, it actually, PERB itself didn't decide the case, but it, or PERB hearing officer did. Uh, and it's a, uh, a 10 U, U37 opinion 1460. It, it's DC Family Service. Anybody here with DC Family Service? Okay. Well, the case involved a RIF, uh, and they, the DC Family Service was abolishing some jobs, and at the same time was going to hire people into new jobs. In other words, they had different they had a different need, and so they were going to hire hire some people. And so they, uh, they, they had the RIF, unions fighting about, fighting about that, and then um, 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 uh, the, 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 the company, uh, sorry, the agency, decided it wanted to tell its employees what, how, what was going on. So they sent an email to the, all the entire staff telling them that we, we've, 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 we, we laid off 35 people, uh, we've, hired, uh, we've hired 10 people, not to replace them, they're doing a different job, but we're using those slots. And we're going to be bringing in 14 more people at the end of the month. Oh, said the union, direct dealing. You're, that's direct dealing. You're talking to our people about high, the hiring process, and it, you're talking to them while, while we're fighting this riff. And that's direct dealing. Perb hearing officer said, no, it's not. That's not direct dealing. They're, informing your employees, sending an email like that, informing your employees about <coughs> events that involve wages, hours, and working conditions, okay. You're not, you're not trying to deal with the, you know, the, the, the unit members. You're not dealing with them. Now, and that was the hearing officer's decision. The union did not take exceptions to that. So when the, the case got to board, there were other issues in the case. When the case got to the board, uh, the board adopted the hearing officer's decision pro forma on that point because there were no exceptions. 
would, 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 do I think Perb would have, would, would have sustained the hearing officer? Yeah. Probably would. It certainly, it, it doesn't amount to, to di direct dealing. So the point here is, is that talking to your, your, um, your staff is, uh, is okay. It can be dangerous. It can be dangerous, and you probably ought to talk to your your labor relations people before you before you do it. But it, you can do it. Okay. That concept of exclusivity can even apply to union members. There's a case that went to the Supreme Court. It was an NLRB case. It was called <coughs> Emporium Capewell. It involved a, it's a, West, a case out in, in, on the West Coast. It involved a, a, a handful of employees who were very, very upset with what they perceived to be the employer's EEO program. They were very upset with the, what, the, um, uh, what the union, um, uh, what, they didn't think the union was pushing it hard enough. What they did instead of going to the union, fighting with the union, they actually went public trying to um, um, undermine the union's position. Okay, the union was, was not in bad faith, the union was in good faith, but they were trying to undermine the union's position. And the employer said, hey, that is not protected activity. <coughs> they're not, they're, they're, this is not, that's not union activity. They are trying to, they're, and they're not just dissidents within the union. These are people who are trying to undermine the union's status as the exclusive bargaining representative. And we don't think that's protected activity, and we're going to fire them. And they did. The case ended up in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, perfectly all right. Perfectly all right. Because the doctrine of exclusivity, the, even the members owe that to the union. They, don't, they have a right to be dissonance. No, I'm not saying that. They have a perfect right to be dissonance. They have a right to oppose the union but they don't have a right to try to undermine the union's status as the exclusive bargaining representatives. At least, they, they certainly don't have a protected right. And when they did, Emporium Capewell teaches that they lost their jobs. Okay. Exclusivity only applies to mandatory subjects only applies to mandatory subjects. Now, that's, at least that's the, that's the law under the NLRA. So if it's a, if it's a, um, if the employer at General Motors wants to deal with the employees about um, whether to make um, more two-door Cadillacs than four-door Cadillacs, okay? It doesn't have anything to do with wages, hours, and working conditions. But he wants to get the employees' sense of that and wants to deal with them on that issue. He wants to encourage them to, I don't, I don't know, it, it's, it's, so, I, I use it only because it's a non-mandatory subject, clearly non-mandatory. That's perfectly permissible. It's when the employer is dealing with the employees on, uh, or the unit members, on issues that go to wages, hours, and other terms and conditions of employment. Now, yes or question? Um, would that apply to a management right? Uh, so well, um, um, that's a, that is a, I, I, that, the, the, the very next point. I don't know the answer to that. I, by the way, I'll try to, I'll, I, I'll ask those guys in the back, they'll tell me afterwards. Um, um, uh, I don't know the answer to that because management rights under PERB now, we're talking about management rights under, under the state. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. The, the union has the right to impact its facts bargaining right. over that management right. rights. So right. Right. Management rights under PERB are, are really permissive subjects. They, they, they are not mandatory subjects. There's no doubt about that. Why are they permissive? Because man, management doesn't have to bargain about them. Um, so I, I suspect, though, if PERB had this case, it would find that direct dealing even about management rights stuff tours of duty, um, uh, for example, or hours or something like that. Um, uh, tours of duty is clearly a, 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 a permissive, sub permissive subject. It's a, a management right. Direct dealing with 
the union about, or with, with members about tours of duty to the bypassing of the union, I think it probably would be found to be an unfair labor practice, but I just don't know. Okay. I'll find out. Okay. Now, um, there's a very important provision in um, CMPA um, that, that deals with um, the rights of employees to present their own grievances. Okay? Section uh, 617.06B, by the way, it's, it's almost exactly the same provision in the National Labor Relations Act, and that, mean, that says employees have, notwithstanding the doctrine of exclusivity, okay, employees have a right to present their own grievances to the employer. The union can't keep them from doing that. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean the employer has to listen to them. <laughs> that doesn't mean the employer has to agree to meet with them. That, that's still for the employer. But if the employer wants to meet with them, the employer has a, a right under 617.06B to meet with them. So they can, employ, they can meet with the employer to discuss their grievances, provided that the union is given notice of the meeting and has a right to, to be there, um, um, uh, provided that the employee is presenting the grievance, his or her grievance, in his own name and not on behalf of the union. That doesn't give, this provision doesn't give them the right to do it on behalf of the union. Provided, too, that any adjustment must be consistent with the collective bargaining agreement. And finally, if the employee is not represented at this meeting, then any adjustment that's made can't be precedent for future resolutions of, the, of uh, uh, grievances. Okay? So exclusivity has its limits. There is an occasion the union and the employer, and the union, sure, sorry, the employer and the employee can sit down and discuss grievances, and the employer can adjust that grievance, provided the union is given opportunity to be present at that meeting. Okay. All right. Uh, how am I doing? Ooh. Well, but the next question was going to be about good faith collective bargaining, and uh, well, I'm going to I'm just I'll begin this, and then then next month I'll begin it again. Okay. Um, and and, and, and the, the question is, what are the standards for bargaining? And we all know, I just used it, just said the word. It's, it's, it's good faith. So, but, but what does CMPA mean? And there are many ways of just defining it. Um, I'll give you a couple of very short definitions. Uh, good faith is a, quote, sincere desire to, a sincere desire, an open mind and sincere effort to find a basis to reach an agreement. Close quote. Or, quote, a bona fide intent to reach an agreement. Close quote. Now, refusals to bargain cases are, are really easy. They're, 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 they're very simple. When the employer just says, I, I just, I'm not going to sit down with you. That's it. I, I know you're the certified representative, but go to PERB. Let make PERB make, make PERB make me. That's, a, that's an easy refusal to bargain. That's an easy uh, bad faith bargaining. It's, 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 just, it's just plain illegal. Um, the hard cases in this area, the hard cases in this area, is where the employer is just going through the motions. It's what is called in the trade surface bargaining. Oh, it looks beautiful on the surface. You know, the employer's smiling and nodding his head. And well, let me know, think about more. Give me, my, I, yeah, I'd like to get some more information about that. Going through all the motions, but when you really look behind what's happening at the table and what's going on in that collective bargaining <coughs> relationship, um, there's, there's, there's no there there. There's simply no there there. The employer is going through the motions. Or the union is going through the motions. Believe it or not, there are cases where the unions have been held to be in violation of the act by refusing to bargain. They're not bargaining. They're going through the motions. Why would a union ever not want a contract? They want to wait till the next election. They maybe want to wait till the next election. They maybe 
maybe they, uh, the, the, the current contract is rolling over and they like this and they know that if they have to get to, imp if they ever end up in impasse, they're going to get the heads handed to them by a, by a mediator or an arbitrator. And so they just stall, 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 stall. That can happen. That can happen. So the, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I don't want to spend any time, much time on that because it doesn't happen that much. But it can happen. It can be a violation of the duty to bargain. It can be surface bargaining. Um, um, it, it, I, I, let, me, let, me, let me finish here. What, a, what, 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 what Perb says about what the law is, okay? I, I said a while back, I know you're sick and tired of me hearing NLRB, and you're probably saying, you know, I know that guy worked for the NLRB for 47 years. That's all he knows. You know, he, he just quotes it back to us. It doesn't mean anything. But I want to I wanna, I wanna, I, 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 I tell you what Perb said, okay? In a case involving D.C. Department of Recreations and Parks, and they said this in 1999, okay? Here's what they said about where, where to look for the law in this area. Instead, we look to precedent under the National Labor Relations Act to provide guidance on what factors to consider when examining this issue. This issue was good faith bargaining. To establish surface bargaining, no one factor is determinative. Rather, the totality of the party's actions during collective bargaining must be examined to determine whether or not the party's conduct establishes a purpose or intent to frustrate or avoid reaching an agreement. A single factor standing alone usually will not demonstrate bad faith. Also, the fact that extensive negotiations fail to produce a contract does not justify an inference that the employer is engaged in bad faith bargaining, close quote. So that's what, that's how Perb defined it's the way it approaches these cases and the fact that Perb has subscribed to NLRB policies. So what I'm, I'm going to stop here We'll, well, I'll, I'll begin a little bit. I'll, I'll, I'll refresh your recollection of this the next time. But we'll, we're, we're really going to begin with the seven things that uh, PERB and the NLRB looks to in trying to determine whether there's surface bargaining going on. So I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to ask you all if you would just sit down. If you have anything you'd like that I, that I went too fast on, you want me to, things you want me to cover next month, uh, with respect to DFR or duty fair representation or the duty to bargain, please write it down and just give it to the lady on the way out, the lady at the desk if you're on the way out, okay? Thank you all. Thanks, Mr. Higgins. I just wanted to remind you that we do have um, a schedule over here as well as uh, the notes from the previous sessions. Also, if you will notice, we are videoing this, uh, these sessions. I promise to have the video uh, on our website. Unfortunately, though, we also, before we can put it on our website, we have to have, I think they're called closed captions for the hearing impaired, and um, which is a requirement of the D.C. government. And so we, had to, uh, we have to do that. But we are, will have our videos on, on our website uh, very soon. And thank you very much for coming out. Thank you very much for being on time. And looking forward to seeing you next month. And any comments you have, please, we want them. We want to improve. And we want to make sure that we also have cover everything that you need to know. <laughs>